I should say four, um, really, because we have a new one that just that just started. But um, this is a, a program that's sponsored by the Bison Working Group. We also have the Prairie Dog Working Group, uh, Mapping Working Group, and just newly convened Bird Working Group. So these are um, groups that are dedicated to those species or those uh, area uh, across the plains with the, the, the plains focus um, with those efforts. And I'm chair of the steering committee of GPCN, as well as chair of the Bison Working Group. Um, and we have a whole, you know, diverse array of participants with that working group, uh, including members of academia, tribes, NGOs, state and federal agencies, and even uh, private uh, reserves such as American Prairie and Southern Plains Land Trust, all dedicated to bison restoration. And it's my great honor today to bring to you um, a special talk by my dear friend uh, and esteemed colleague, Rob Robbie Magnum. And I'll give you his bio here. Robbie is director of the Fish and Game Department of Fort Peck Reservation, has served for the director uh, for more than 30 years. He was instrumental in establishing the Buffalo program there and oversees all aspects of daily operations. And under his leadership, the program now manages the quarantine facility. So this is a facility that he'll be talking about where Yellowstone bison are transferred from the park to Fort Peck that undergo final brucellosis disease testing and then are made available to tribes all across the country. Um, He's also an active member of the Pate Group, which is a buff Buffalo stakeholder group with the Cinnabon Sioux tribes there at Fort Peck. Really important uh, facilitating a suite of community engagement activities. Um, and he's a member of the Tribal College Research Network Steering Committee. He also oversees um, proposed actions for Fort Peck to, to work on pro professional development opportunities um, for new hires and to recruit new staff for the Buffalo program. So he's a true leader in the Buffalo world, not just with the Fort Peck tribes, but with all things tribal Buffalo programs, Fort Peck is truly a model in how to manage a cultural herd and as a clearinghouse for Yellowstone um, bison to go to, to tribes. And I like to call Robbie the Buffalo Whisperer because if you've been out there in the field with him, it's just like that. They seem to, he has a way with them and it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so really with um, no more to say other than just really happy to hear uh, your talk today and, and to welcome everybody here. So Robbie, I'll uh, be sharing your presentation and then um, we'll have you kick it off. Okay, sounds good. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, basically, we're, this is about is uh, the Fort Peck Cinnabon and Sioux Tribes Yellowstone Buffalo Quarantine Facility update on there. And go ahead, next click. Yeah, one moment. I'm just going to do the slideshow from the beginning. Okay, here we go. Okay. Okay, there's the big screen. Everybody sees that? Can you see it, Robbie? Yeah, I can see it. Good. Perfect. I'm going to mute and you just tell me. Okay. Um, Basically, it, our core team facility started out where you first started out. Uh, Montana sued Yellowstone National Park over Buffalo leaving it into Montana and uh, creating the, uh, affecting their livestock on the brucellosis. So basically, out of that lawsuit, Yellowstone National Park developed a, a experimental to see if it's possible to get Buffalo out of Yellowstone National Park for cirrhosis free. So they started a quarantine study. And that went on for about three different uh, years to where the first group that they did that graduated, they ended up giving the Ted Turner and the Fort Peck tribes got the second group. The second group we kept, the Yellowstone went through their three years quarantine there and they came to Fort Peck for five years and see if they'd stay versus free, which they did. And the first group that the Fort Peck tribes had graduated in 2017. And at that time, USDA, APHIS, and Yellowstone were contemplating a possibly stopping the experiment. 
So the Fort Peck tribe stood up and said that we'd like to propose a quarantine facility, quarantine facilities on the Fort Peck reservation. Okay, next one. What we did, we built a quarantine facilities up there, which shows our main holding pen. This pen here could hold about 150 animals inside that. Okay, next one. And this is the alleyway lead to the um, crowding tub when you work with the buffalo to do the annual testing, or I take that back, semi-annual testing. Okay, next. This basically is the crowding tub with the quarantine handling facilities. This is what some buffalo out we actually were testing in there. Next. Okay, and this is a squeeze chute we have since then put a new one on. We found out with this chute here that the Yelton buffalo are too large to fit in here, so we had to get a new one put in. Okay. And there's four some various sorting pens for various types of groups when we're working them. What these, um, and this here on each pen, we had a water well drilled and stock tanks installed in each quarantine pasture. What we have here is we found out the best water tanks are your old tractor tires. Like the, they can't destroy them. We put in Fiberglass tanks, the buffalo would break them up. Steel tanks, they'd break them up. But these water, these water tires, they they worked the about the best. Next, okay, the, the, the four big tribes MOU with Montana on a five years beta study was completed in 2017. This is when we did release them on their final ins inspection. Next, okay, disease testing. Buffalo must be quarantined and repeatedly tested for brucellosis for one to three years. The first two years of testing is conducted in Yellowstone National Park. The final year of assurance testing is conducted on the Fort Peck quarantine facilities. Okay, prior before we leave the Fort Peck, the buffalo are being ready to ship from Yellowstone National Park to Fort Peck after being rounded up. This here is in Yellowstone. Okay, then they uh, go in route from, from Yellowstone to Fort Peck. On the left one, it shows Load Corrin Springs, which is conducted by USDA APHIS, and Stevens Creek is conducted by Yellowstone National Park facilities. And then they are transported 500 miles to the Fort Peck reservation in one day. And then prior to when they finally arrive at Fort Peck Tribes for insurance testing. Okay. This is here is a picture of the Bison Conservation Transfer Program. The goal is to rehome Yellowstone origin buffalo to tribes supporting ecological and cultural conservation of the species. The results is reduced the number of animals that are slaughtered preserves unique genetics of Yellowstone Buffalo, and the partners in it is Yellowstone National Park, USDA APHIS, State of Montana, Intertribal Buffalo Council, Defenders of Wildlife, and the Greater Yellowstone Coalition. Since the transfer program began, we have uh, given to 28 different tribes in 16 states, Buffalo, to include in Alaska. And there it shows you from the first year we did it, 2013 to 22, actually what's done on here is we actually released some here in 23 also. Okay. Okay, Fort Belknap received a family group of 36 buffalo on the agreement with Montana Fish, Wild and Forks and officially received buffalo transfer in fall of two, 2014. When we made agreement to take the buffalo in the first experiment, we agreed that we'd give half of our buffalo for Belknap. And this here shows the picture that they, they got there. 
In 2016, the Fort Peck tribes transferred seven cows and one bull to the Bronx Zoo in New York. 2019, Buffalo transfers five breeding bulls were shipped to Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. This is the first group that, that uh, we got of all breeding bulls that year. Next. In, in 2020, Buffalo transfers from Fort Peck. The Fort Peck tribes transfer Yellowstone Buffalo breeding bulls to the following tribes. Three of them to Alaska. That's probably, again, one of our most notable um, transfers. One was the Shoshone but Bannock tribes to Idaho. Two went to Perry Band, Pottawatomie Army in Kansas. Three went to Blackfeet tribes in Montana. Three went to North Dakota Standing Rock Reservation. Two went to Cheyenne Arapaho tribe in Oklahoma. Two bulls went to Cherokee tribes in Oklahoma. The Bodoc tribe in Oklahoma received one. Pawkaw, Oklahoma received three breeding bulls. Cheyenne River, South Dakota received three bulls. Flangeau, South Dakota received two. Ugloss, Ugloss tribes in South Dakota received three. Sissy and Wapton, South Dakota received three. Kalispell, Washington received two. Forest County, part of Army, Wisconsin received. And Oneida, Wisconsin received three also. Again, a real notable one. This one here was in Alaska. We dubbed this Operation Buffalo Wings. What it did is FedEx blew, flew especially made shipping containers from Seattle to Anchorage. One bull rode alone, two others shared a one container. ITBC supported the transfer. Melissa Barnes stands in front of one of the shipping containers that the bulls traveled in. She checked on them regular throughout the journey to Alaska, and they were seemed to handle the ride okay. This here shows a picture of our Operation Buffalo Wings where they were loading them from Alaska via FedEx airplane. This is where they arrived, Buffalo arrived on their new home in Kodiak Island in Alaska. In the year 2021 and 22, four peg Buffalo transfers. This is where we first started uh, oh no, these were the initial still in our pools. In 2021, the Four Peck tribes transferred the first family group of buffalo to the three affiliated tribes in the Mundan, Hadassah, and Rickroll Nation, consisting of 45 buffalo. That was our, our, our first family group transfer. In 2022, the following tribes received buffalo from Four Peck, consisting of Yellowstone breeding bulls. Three more went to Blackfeet. Uh, Cheyenne River received three. Forest County, not Potter Army received two. Lower Bro received eight. Ugalala received three. Osage received two bulls. Pontica Tribe received two bulls. Perry Band and Potter Army also received two bulls. And Perry Island received two big bulls. In 2023, the Four Pick Tribes gave a green bull to the Corps of Engineers at the Four Pick Dam. And we also give uh, Four Pick Tribes gave a breeding bull to CMR Russell Wildlife Refuge for their viewing park in Lewistown, Montana. The second final brewers test that they are they are shipped for their to their to their new homes in 23 Peoria, Oklahoma, received 15 buffalo of a family group. Eastern Shoshone in Wyoming received 10. Northern Cheyenne, Montana received 25. Monarch Tribe received 25. And Ponica Tribe in Nebraska received 10. Yellowstone Buffalo are, are unloaded on the Fort Peck, the Pure Tribe of Indians in Oklahoma. This is showing what we got there, released there. Family group arrived at Peoria tribe. This is their facilities. Family group scoping out the new home in Peoria on December 23rd, Buffalo transfer. 
Nor and Cheyenne Tribal Buffalo Transfer on December 23. Ponica Tribe of Nebraska has released a family group of 10 Yellowstone Buffalo into their pastures. Also in 23, the Forfeit Tribe's Buffalo Transfer was in collaboration with Canadian Native Americans to establish herds on their lands. An agreement with the Canadian officials on testing protocols for diseases could not be mutually agreed upon. So the 65 Buffalo that had originally planned to send to Canada were instead rehomed by the efforts of the New Chicago Buffalo uh, Council. Uh, 24 rehoming efforts. Uh, Uwila, South Dakota received 26. Rosebud, South Dakota received 14. And the Northern Cheyenne, Montana received 25. Buffalo arrived four packs in Northern Cheyenne in 2024. These are the ones that we had at the original one designed for Canada. Transfer 14 Buffalo, he also Buffalo to Rosebud Sioux Tribe. And he also Buffalo checked out the new home in Rosebud. Quarantine facility update, current updates. Currently, there are 108 Yellowstone Buffalo in our quarantine pens for a third step of the quarantine measures to ensure that the buffalo are healthy and disease-free. The USDA set new mandates for testing. Males are now only required to be tested once during their 12-month period. Once the buffalo graduate from the quarantine program, they are integrated into the tribe's cultural and business herds are transferred to other tribes. The Forbrick tribes work alongside our partners of Buffalo Conservation, such as Defenders of Wildlife, World Wildlife Fund, the Intertribal Buffalo Council, to transfer these buffalo to other Native nations. Next. Future expansive plans. We would like to add in additional holding pen to maximize how many buff Yellowstone Buffalo we can hold for insurance testing. To upgrade the current corral systems for easier handling during testing, we would like to start out with more entities interested in Yellowstone Buffalo genetics and a continued collaboration with the Canadian government to establish Buffalo herds across the Minnesota line. Work with establishing a herd on a CMR wildlife refuge in Montana and other federal, state, and land management agencies instituted in receiving Yellowstone Buffalo. These are the partners that we work with, Fort Peck Tribes, uh, National Park Service, Intertribal Buffalo Council, USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, Defenders of Wildlife, World Wildlife Fund, and the Greater Yellowstone Coalition. Partner roles, Defenders of Wildlife financially supports and coordinates transportation of buffalo to the new homes and for fencing and labor costs of the facilities, as well as for funding for emergency aid needed due to drought conditions. ITBC, Intertribal Buffalo Council, finds new homes for the buffalo and making transportation arrangements to send buffalo to their new homes. Bureau of Indian Affairs, Financial support for continuous fencing, purchasing emergency aid. Yellowstone National Park supplies Yellowstone Buffalo to the Forfeit Tribes and provides technical support when needed. World Wildlife Fund collaborated with um, DLW for aid funds and contributed to costs for aid. USDA APHIS provides semi annual brucerosis testing. Of the buffalo and for the buffalo program and the vets to transport the animals from park to Fort Pat. Great Yellowstone Coalition provides funding to expand the Stevens Creek facility managed by Yellowstone National Park. Any questions or concerns? Thank you. 
Thank you, Robbie. Well done. That was pretty amazing. All those years of transferring Buffalo, Yellowstone Buffalo from Fort Peck to the tribes. And uh, yeah, I loved all the photos. Um, we have a question, Cliff. Vanessa, Robbie, thank you very much for that. Um, as a Canadian, we hear a lot of pushback on the disease issue. And I was wondering in that third year of testing, have you ever had a positive show up uh, that late? Never in our history of our facility has we tested a positive. Well, I, I work with Yellowstone quite a bit, and usually after about the 117th day their during their quarantine, is when they, they start hitting all negatives. Yeah. So the Canadian dispute, if you want to say, in terms of, you know, the testing and, and that, do you think it's pretty easily resolvable given your history? I I would think so because, you know, they, they've been three years in quarantine and letting them around. You've got reports about no positives on there. I think it could be, we can work it out. Right now, there's just issues about other diseases and that's mainly TB. And I've talked with Yellowstone. They don't have no problems with TB there, and we don't have no TB problems here. So they're very minimal, if that. More concern about transfer from domestic livestock to bison than there is the other way around. Yes. That's what I have to educate a lot of people all the time, is that they think brucellosis is a buffalo disease. It's actually a cattle disease that they infected the buffalo with. But the buffalo got the bad day. Thanks again. Thanks, Cliff. Uh, Pui Yiling, uh, Defenders of Wildlife. Um, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi, um, I'm from the Defenders of Wildlife uh, based in DC. So um, thanks for your presentation. It's very informative. And um, I mean, everyone can see that I'm a city girl. So I have a very basic question. Is that um did you use like bison? I mean bison and buffalo interchangeably? Like when you say buffalo, do you mean bison in this uh, case? It's a very interesting question because that's used both ways a lot. Native Americans usually like to consider them as buffalo. But I have a lot of people ask questions: what's the difference between a bison and a buffalo? So what I have to tell them, bison is a scientific name. Buffalo is the common name, but they're both the same species. Thank you. That's good. Other questions? Tony? You're on mute. There. there. Can Sorry. you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, given our goals uh, in the Alberta foothills and that the Alberta foothills are, are currently um, pretty much uh, populated with uh, grazing herds of cattle, um, and the brucellosis issue seems to be a, a one way issue cattle to buffalo. Now, my concern is um, how is, how is, um, it, how is brucellosis um, transferred, you know, from cattle to uh, buffalo if it does occur? Is it um, airborne? Is it soil-borne? I'm, I'm a little unclear exactly what the mechanisms are, are involved there. Um, and given the fact that uh, we're proposing to introduce buffalo onto traditional cattle ranges, I'm, I'm concerned about uh, the animals may initially be brucellosis-free, but then I'm concerned about... Um, contraction of uh, brucellosis in, in the future if there's particularly if brucellosis is soil born. Okay, brucellosis basically is affected by uh, a female reproductive organs and when they have their calf or after birth or if they have a miscarriage it, it, the brucellosis comes out on that and basically it's a bacteria that will die within 72 hours after it gets the air. So the whole trick about watching for brucellosis is keeping your species apart during calving time mm. on there. And if you can keep them separated, you have no problem. 
Right. So it, 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 in terms of my concerns, that's, it's mainly uh, resolvable through uh, proper management, uh, from what I understand, uh, management of the herds. Yeah. Right. If you manage them, keep, again, keep the species apart, you have no problems. Mm. We had that concern around here, and now that people got educated, there's no concern. A lot of our mm. local ranchers were scared, but now that they found out, it's not as contagious as a lot of people like to portray it as. There's a very small opportunity that you can get it. And by during your birthday time, if you keep your species apart, you will never have a problem. That's very interesting and good to hear because I know there's a lot of misconceptions being perpetrated out there. Um, not least uh, of which was that uh, television program, Yellowstone, about the yeah. ranch. Uh, yeah, yeah, they actually, uh, in one of their discourses, uh, in one of the programs, uh, they, yeah. yeah, they were talking about brucellosis and buffalo, and I, I knew that that was inaccurate. Uh, um, so, yeah, it's good to uh, confront and, and to uh, um, eliminate some of the misconceptions. Yeah, a lot of people think it's airborne. It, it's not. People think if a, a animal urinates in the water, could they get it that way? No, it's not possible like that. Great. Thank you. That's good to hear. Yeah, and follow up to that, Robbie, do you think that's a testament to the interagency bison management plan and the amount of disease testing that goes in? I mean, there's never been a documented case of bison transmitting brucellosis to cattle. We know it's elk as the main transmitters, but why do you attribute, you, you said good management, but what does that look like for the Yellowstone bison? It's, it's hard to really say because you can, uh, Educate the people, but if they're not going to believe you, they're not going to believe you mm -hmm. on there. And again, with the Buffalo Quarantine Program, they're in quarantine three years, usually after from beginning to 168 days, and they, they don't test positive no more. And, you know, that basically, if they're going to get what well, we're more worried about, if the outcome on to our reservation that have first losses affect our Buffalo, that's what we're scared of. Mm -hmm. Other um, questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Hi, my name is Wenfei Tong, and I work at the Lab of Ornithology um, at Cornell in upstate New York, Ithaca. But I used to live in Missoula, Montana, and loved it there. And I did quite a lot of work um, for a brief time on the National Bison Range. And I was just wondering if um, or how you're aiming to expand the different places that you could exchange or send bison to across the whole continent um what, what the the hurdles are as well as the the hopes in terms of keeping the genetic pool um as diverse as possible yes it's very important that we keep the diverse genetic pool going and, and i would love to see muscle transfer all over to, because it a lot of people that have buffalo don't have big enough herds to keep the genetics going. So it's important that we transfer breeding bulls around to make sure you got your genetics moving. And that's our hope to do with this program. Every year that we get more bulls, we ask people that are interested to get the genetics going. And i like to see some Elk Island bulls from Canada come down this way to help spread the genetics. Thank you, good question. A follow up to that, Robbie, how important is it to manage these animals, the genetics, uh, manage these animals as wildlife under like fish and game departments at Fort Peck versus like agricultural, like your business herd? Okay, we have two herds here on Fort Peck. We have a business herd and a cultural herd. Our business herd, we run almost like a cattle operation. We got one bull for every 15 cows to maximize our, our calving. But with our conservation herd, our wild herd, we try to keep that as natural as possible. We run a 60-40 sex ratio with 40% of them being male. That's more chance or less chance of getting inbreeding on there. And, and, and it works a lot better. And we have in our management plan, we let them forage for themselves. The only time we'll supplemental feed them is if there's a drought, a fire, or 
a severe winter. And actually, we had to do it this year because of, of the drought. It's the first year we had to do it in 13 years to have supplemental feed them. That's the difference between our herds. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, Cliff. Uh, obviously, we've had some recent legislative changes in Montana. And is that making your life more difficult? Is the community making your life more difficult? <laughs> you know, what I know you're soldiering on and getting great things done still. And uh, we're just trying to make sure we can have as free flow of these animals as possible and, and get populations started wherever they're needed. Uh, but, you know, these kind of roadblocks and challenges that get thrown your way sometimes, I just like kind of the current state of affairs uh, without slagging anybody too hard, but it's just to understand, yeah, just just some of the difficulties you you face. Actually, it's uh, it's pretty easy. I get along good with the community, our, especially our ranching community on the reservation. They realize what they first heard, a lot of it was rumors and any end those. On their, I get good communication with them. My problem is with the political process, that they spread information out that's not really true. And I keep asking them to put out a survey in Montana to see what the public's really interested in buffalo restoration. And the last survey they did, 75% of Montana's wanted to see buffalo relocated. But yet the legislative process didn't allow that. And that's what who we gotta focus on is on our elected officials to help us get to where we would like to go. Because I'd love to see buffalo restored on the all lands that they once roamed that they could possibly go on. That's helpful. We're probably facing the same kind of numbers in Alberta. Good public support, but some political opposition from some powerful quarters. Question. Thanks, Cliff. Other questions for Robbie? Hello. You know, we can hear you, Mike. Oh, there's Mike. You're kind of warbling a bit, so. Can you hear me? Yep. I'm muted somehow. You're good. You Mike, can, can you me. introduce yourself to Robbie, please? Hi, Robbie. Hello. Mike Judd. I'm a president of the Foothills Bison Restoration Society in Alberta. Uh, we're very interested in what you're doing down there. We've been uh, toying with the idea of doing a community survey up here to find out if Albertans are interested in putting bison back on our public land, which is what we're focused on. And uh, just wondering if you have some kind of a template uh, for the kind of questions that you ask the people in Montana regarding uh, their interest in bison. Not really, we just basically focus on what, why would they want to have buffalo go you know, for cultural purposes, for tourism, or whatever they'd be interested in down there? And most people just want to see them repopulated on the grasslands for viewing. Yeah, and, and Mike, I can send you those two surveys that Robbie referenced. Um, they're a little outdated. I mean, we did present them at the Montana legislature uh, during some bad bison bills and to no avail, but they still uh, were really important. Like Robbie said, majority of Montanans want to see bison restored to tribal lands and similar numbers, 76% to public lands. So CMR is, is a great example. So there's tr tremendous public support of Montana. It's just not the political <laughs> support that we'd like to see at the leadership levels, but I'll, I'll send those to you. Um, Robbie, maybe you could mention to Mike though that you all did that community survey before you started your Buffalo program with WWF, the grassroots survey with your... Oh, okay, well, locally we did questions at our local citizens about it and those British people didn't quite understand it until they actually got here then they realized that, yes, that Buffalo played a very important role with our community, especially here on the reservation here, that 
basically, Buffalo had basically always been part of our economy. And what we explained to them was that they could be part of our economy again because the Buffalo provided everything we needed. They were basically our Walmart at them times. And it just go, they provide what we needed. And people are starting to realize that now that we're restoring Buffalo in our diet. And Native Americans play a big role on diet problems because the way they're, they are eat their food consumption now. But when they go back to eat buffalo, they're eating a more healthier diet and they don't have that problem with diabetes and heart disease, stuff like that, by eating the more leaner meat. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, uh, Shami, we'll really look forward to getting those surveys from you. I think Montana and Alberta have very similar general outlook from the general public regarding putting wildlife back uh, in its natural home here. And uh, we're really looking forward to getting those answers so we can move forward with this. Yeah, and Mike, um, another important thing that Robbie alluded to in his talk was the Pate group, you know, with Johnny Bear Cub Stiff Farm and many members there at Fort Peck. They have been rather instrumental, Robbie, to the Buffalo program and to making sure that there is that community engagement and benefit that translates to the council having that appreciation to continue to fund the Buffalo program. Isn't that right, Robbie? Yes, well, we, we discovered by, if you have a problem, instead of going to your elected officials, go to the community that elects them and get them to buy in on your idea. And they tell the elected officials, boom, all of a sudden the elected officials are jumping in on it. That's why it's important now in Montana or actually out in Canada is you convince your community what you want to do or what benefits you'll pay by restoring Buffalo and have them tell their elected officials so they can change their mind. Well said. Uh, Elizabeth, I see you came on the screen. Yeah, I finished my lunch. Um, I did. I would add on that 2015 survey that we did, um, there was, it, it actually raised a lot of awareness and it also informed the Buffalo program where the gaps were, like what the people up there didn't really understand about the Buffalo program, didn't understand about their opportunities for hunting. And it also gathered information about um, how they felt about the Buffalo as, as wildlife, as livestock or what. And um, just in general, sort of cultural attitudes about the Buffalo. So, and I think it was an instrumental um, survey in sort of a little bit of awakening of people as to, oh, I can connect with the Buffalo program up there. I can give my input, I can be involved, et cetera. I, I think, would you agree, Robbie, about that? 100%. Elizabeth, could you just let, let everybody know who you, you're with MSU, your, your title and, and how long you've been working with Fort Peck, which is sure, really sure. Awesome. Um, well, my work at MSU, I'm the project development and grant specialist in the College of Education, Health and Human Development. But part of my um, appointment actually, thankfully, includes being able to continue my work with the Pate Group that we got started in 2015. I was part of that um, in the beginning with along with Robbie and a number of other partners. And um, I've been working with partners up there since about 2012, when we got the um, Tribal uh, Institutional Review Board started and partners on that said, hey, we need to know what effect the Buffalo are having on our community health and well-being. And um, so our activities starting in 2015 we're really focused on building those connections. We're working on a trail, we're working on educational programming, and we're working on supporting the Buffalo program and the health of the land and the Buffalo. Thank you. Right on, Elizabeth. Yeah, amazing. And has 
been a champion for really important National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, America the Beautiful Challenge funding coming to Fort Peck. Uh, it's, it's been really great having Elizabeth and MSU so engaged over the years. Uh, we have another question, uh, let's see. I'm trying to see. <laughs> Was PU had a question? Yeah, PU. Had a... Thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> um, yes, hi. Um, so um, my I have like two questions. Uh, one is like a tap on to the uh, local um, leader support. I, um, have you guys worked with like say the state um, centers or like house representative? Uh, what I understand is like they do not support the re reintroduction of the buffalo. So I wonder what is the reason or what are the reasons that they they do not support. And the other question is like, um, I understand that the survey that you like WWF and you all did was like in 2015. So it's about like 10 years ago. So are you planning to redo it again or you know, just to get get an update if like people's uh perspective has changed and like given that they they know more about the program and stuff like that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. We've been uh, requesting the state of Montana for, for the last five six years. We'd like to do another survey just to show that there's still an interest there, but for some reason they don't want to do it. And I think it's best that you know if we do. Is, Another survey to show that there's still good interest there, mm -hmm. and I would I would love to see another survey. Yeah, we're hoping we can garner those the su support from the partners. It's it's pretty it's ex it's an investment, but it's an important investment. But uh, honestly, the last survey didn't even resonate with some of these politicians. They just didn't want to even. It wasn't data that was really advocating for them to to change their votes. There's so it's 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 tough in Montana. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, right, Robbie? Yeah. But to, to her first question, how do you work? You know, sovereign nations, native nations. How do you work with state government or entities representatives when you're your own government? You know, how do you appeal to them? It's when we work with local state agencies like our counties, stuff like that. We work got a real good working relationship. But when you get up to the, I'd say, the Montana's Hill, I guess it's called Capitol, that's where things change. They don't want to, to listen to you. you they, they turn a blind ear on you. They don't want, so you can't get no communication done. And what kind of saddens me is that they, they live on false information. And they don't research to find out both sides of the story. And that's what we need to get changed. Mm hmm Okay, very thoughtful. Thank you. Other questions? I have something kind of random, mm -hmm. um, but I I spent some time um, in the front range of Montana, and I you know wrote someone like um, David Letterman's old horse and things like that. So there are all these fairly famous celebrity types that have property in places like Montana and have buffalo herds can, are any of them sympathetic and can you use them to join the cause and um like you you know ted turner has all this all these buffalo properties are they are some of them able to be really good collaborators it's hard to deal with uh, your big organizations like that because yeah. ted turner is basically Runs his as a business. Oh, okay. So he don't want to get on, on conservation type deals. Yeah. I'm not saying he don't totally, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had to ask. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the distinction. I think the distinction is they're managing those herds for agricultural livestock, so it's a different, okay. it's a different, you know, lens. Whereas you know these animals are of high genetics, important for restoration of the species to tribal lands manages wildlife as on large enough la landscapes as they can possibly handle or yeah. be able to have available, you know, with that forage. Um, so it's a difference, but 
Yeah, no, I mean, it's a good question. It's like trying to get more celebrity support, you know, or more high profile people to support is is definitely something we'd like to see. Maybe Leonardo DiCaprio, he seems to be really interested in wildlife. Maybe he wants to help with Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I haven't watched all these, you know, like Yellowstone and whatnot, but that's how so many other people who've, who don't have direct experience with places like that know yeah. the area. And um, I've seen in New York City, there's quite, a, you know, hot end restaurants. People are very interested in things like grass finished beef, but they don't even know that grass, most beef are grass fed. Most cows are grass fed. They're just not grass finished necessarily. Right. Mm -hmm. So yes. I, I'm just thinking if you could harness this much larger interest in Mm -hmm. um, like, I think most people don't know that bison are often managed, the bison that they eat in the store from the store that they can buy in a fancy restaurant is managed really differently from bison that is ideally managed in a way that's more right. like what no, they, they don't. used to do, how they used to live as wildlife. So so I, I kind of feel like there has to be some kind of harnessing of that interest and that momentum that goes beyond the, the home states. But sorry, I mean, that's not very well articulated. Yeah, well, I think it is. And I think, Shami, you could talk about some of the recent films that have come out. We have the Bison Treaty 10th anniversary celebrations coming up mm -hmm. this September. I think mm -hmm. it's a building momentum in terms of getting the word out and and Shami might want to talk about some of that, those recent uh, things that she's been involved with. Yeah, I mean, no, it's a, it's a really good point. You know, half a million bison in, in America, and the majority of which are managed for agriculture on very small parcels of land. You know, there's about 25,000 in tribal herds, including Fort Peck is such an incredible model, and about 25,000 in Department of Interior herds. So, you know, 50,000. But the idea is to grow them. So Robbie, you know, having a herd, his cultural herd grow to a thousand animals or more um, from 400 on 17,000 acres to like upwards of a thousand animals on even that many more acres where tribes can get gain back their own lands back under their ownership and have those lands dedicated to their buffalo program. It's a win-win for the species, for their communities, but also for the grasslands, the health of that you know, re recovering that keystone animal ecologically. And no, there's uh, some, some great films that have come out recently. Um, you know, Bring Them Home is is starting to make, we, we had that uh, in Missoula and there's a Buffalo Treaty film that's coming out. And, and we, we're happy to share this on the Great Plains Conservation Network. If the fact that you're on this call, we'll be putting out like where you can go see these films and learn more. And tribes are leading the way, and particularly, you know, leaders like Robbie, um, you know, really making a difference with bringing back buffalo to their lands for their people, but also the species coming back because it's it, we did a number on those animals <laughs> over the years. Great. Uh, well, on behalf of the Great Plains Court, uh, Conservation Network, I just want to thank Robbie so much for speaking to us today. That was really lovely. Yeah. Um, did you have any final thoughts to close before we leave today, Rory? Okay, yeah. Department of Management. It's Paul Santavi put a, a nice little note in the chat there. Um, I was including other other herds, other animals, uh, but yeah, about 25,000 in public herds and about 25,000 in tribal. Um, Robbie, did you have any closing thoughts or comments? No, other than you said, I went up. Our goal here for our conservation places is that we would like to run probably about 1,500 head on 150,000 acres. That's our, our goal. And we had a potential, but, but the hard part is continuously changing our fence to get to that size. But yeah. it's a good problem. It's a good problem. Yeah. Well, thank you we so much, Robbie, for your time and everyone for the, you know spending the, the noon lunch hour with us and Robbie. And I uh, hope you can come back and hear some more webinars. Uh, Sage Grouse, Lindsay is the next one coming up with Vera Smith, Defenders of Wildlife. That's right. Uh, May 10th at noon. Mark your calendars. <laughs> Send it to all your friends. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. Yeah, have a good one.
Thank you, Thanks Robbie. Again. Bye, everybody. Yep.